32, victory was won at Calvary. Amen. <laughs>
Satan. And I question, oh Father, how long? Then I take one more look at Mount Calvary. And it gives me the strength to go Sacred Crenshaw. That's the one that was enjoying taking up all the chains this morning, I think. Yeah. I got the biggest kick out of that. I love children, and I know you do too. Thank God for these children. I got two children, five grandchildren. Somebody said they call them grandchildren because they're so grand. 
Somebody said them grandchildren are so good, don't see why in the world we couldn't have them first. Sacred Christians, chapter 12, verse 1. It is expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Notice the word revelations. Then go on down to verse 7. Verse 7. And Paul said, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that was given to me, a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing, I besought the Lord thrice and prayed about it, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. To me, that's one of the greatest statements in all the Bible. <clears throat> my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. More God's ways are not our ways. God's strength is not made perfect in strength, is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in mine infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. I'm preach a little while with the help of God on the ministry of the thorn. Would you pray in your heart as I pray audibly, ask God to speak? I want to be of a blessing to you, I really do. <clears throat> now, Father and our God in heaven, God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for sin. Thank you, precious Jesus. You're the best thing ever happened to us or ever will happen to us. I'm thankful for the privilege to be back again this evening. God, I can't thank you enough for letting me come to be with God. He's our precious brothers and sisters in Christ here at Canaan Land and be with Brother John's as family. Thank you for giving Brother John's and I a kindred spirit. Thank you so much for this good man. Thank for the good times we've had together over the years. Continue to bless his health and bless Miss John's health. Oh God, thank you for these wonderful people. Now God, thank you for the truth of God that's found in this chapter. Father, I pray, God, that you'll help those here to say them to have a thorn in the flesh. Give us all the grace you gave the Apostle Paul. And I think you have promised that it's sufficient. Speak to our hearts now. For if, if there is one here lost in Jesus' name, save that soul. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Now, 
the ministry of the thorn. Now, a lot of ministers in and through the church. You have preaching, teaching, praying. You have a youth ministry. Bus ministry. Radio, TV ministry. Some churches do, I'm talking about Some churches have a jail ministry, prison ministry. Church, some churches have a nursing home ministry. Some churches even have a death ministry. But all of these are ministries to others. The thorn is a ministry to me and you. I'm talking about the ministry of the thorn. Now there's a difference between trials and thorns. Thorns are more permanent. They come to stay. Trials are temporary. They come and they go. So if you have a thorn in the flesh, it'll probably go with you to the grave. Paul's thorn went with him to the grave. Once God gave him this thorn, they never got rid of it. And I want to say something other before we go any further. He was better off with it than without it. And if you have a thorn in the flesh, though it may be very painful, very discouraging, you're better off with it than without it. If it were not for a thorn in flesh, some of us may not even be in church this evening. So there's the difference between thorns and trials. Then there's a the difference between thorns and chastisement. Chastisement is to get the sin out once it gets in, but the thorn is to keep the sin from ever getting in. That's what it did for Paul. He kept that pride out of his heart. So I want to look at, first of all, Paul's privileges. Second, Paul's peril. Thirdly, Paul's pain. Paul's prayer, then Paul's provisions, last of all, Paul's praise, just like God gave it to me back years ago. I put this message a lot since I came down with that COVID back a couple of years ago. That stuff almost killed me. <clears throat> now I'm still suffering from it because if you have it real bad, you have a tendency to have vertigo, and I have certainly got that bad. I fight that every day of my life, that vertigo. But, like the Bible says, Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Hallelujah. That's what I'm finding. I'm finding his grace is sufficient. So we notice, first of all, Paul's privileges. Paul was greatly blessed of God. Paul talked about these revelations while well, he wrote half the New Testament. Greatly blessed of God. He had several su successful missionary journeys. Had people saved on his ministry. He established churches, ordained elders. So we see something of Paul's privileges. Secondly, we see Paul's peril. It's obvious what it is. It's found in verse 7 twice. 
lest I should be exalted above measure. That's pride, folks. Then look at the last phrase in the same verse. Lest I should be exalted above measure. Paul talking about himself. You say, you mean as great a Christian as Paul was is in danger of getting lifted up with pride? Yes. That's what the book says. See, if you're successful at anything, you're a candidate for the thorn. Amen. It doesn't just have to be the ministry. You can be a successful doctor, a lawyer. You can be a successful businessman, farmer. You can be a successful mechanic, a carpenter. If you're successful at anything and you're a Christian, then you're a candidate for the thorn because the devil's going to try to get you lifted up with pride. And that's one of the hardest things in the world to keep out of your heart is pride. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can you imagine somebody coming up to Brother John and say, I want to teach a course on humility in your school. Well, that automatically disqualify him right there. Because he'd be saying, I'm humble enough to teach him. So we're talking about Paul's peril, which was quiet. See, the Bible says pride goes before destruction, a haunted spirit before fall. Right. The Bible says he that exalted himself shall be abased, right. but he that humbles himself shall be exalted. The Bible says God resists the power by giving grace to the humble. Proverbs chapter 6, Solomon said, These six things that the Lord hate. Yea, seven are abominations to God. First one on the list, a proud look. If this bottle of water was a cup or glass of water, and it was half full, I could brought, well, I could probably walk back and suppose across this platform a good while without spilling a drop. But fill it up to the brim. Yeah. You get the message. It's hard to carry a full cup without spilling it. Martin Luther, the white man got saved and came out of the Roman Catholic Church some four or five hundred years ago, made one of the most powerful statements I've ever read or heard in my life. He said, I've often seen God allow preachers and leaders in churches get into the sin of adultery as a judgment upon their sin of pride. Now, boy, that's a powerful statement. Let me repeat that. He said, I've often seen God or our preachers and leaders in churches to get into the sin of adultery as a judgment upon their sin of pride. I've seen that. I've seen that happen to folks. I've seen folks get lifted up with pride. Next thing you know, next thing you know, they got in the awful sin of adultery. It's a judgment upon their sin of pride. I remember back years ago, <clears throat> long time ago, there's a well-known preacher in this country, I won't call his name, but he used to pastor a great big church up north. And he was preaching a meeting in this church that was having morning and evening services. And some of us wanted to hear this preacher. And after one of the morning services, 
we went over to the fellowship hall to have a meal. This man sat across the table from me. I could have reached over and touched his head. That's how close by it was. And by the time we finished the meal, I thought to myself, this has got to be one of the most arrogant men I've ever met in my life. Well, you know what happened, happened to him in due time? He got into the awful sin of adultery. God hates pride. Right. Amen. He hates my pride. He hates your pride. Hates the devil's pride. That's what got the devil kicked out of heaven was pride. Right. He said, I'll be like the most high God. Yeah, and God cast him down. Next of all, we see Paul's pain. Notice the Bible says in verse 7. <clears throat> Paul said, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Paul's pain. He was given a thorn in the flesh. I studied this out back years ago. This is not comparative to the thorn on your rose bush, ladies. No, it's a stake. It's a post pointed on the end. And sometimes they would impale people on those things. Stick them down on that post and the point of that post would go right up on the chest cavity and of course they would kill the victim. Right. Paul said, that's the kind of a thorn that I have. What I have, in other words, is comparative to that. Very, very painful. Come up, Paul's pain. Then he said, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. And that means to slug, to beat with a fist. From the time that God gave Paul this thorn, the devil beat on him. Day after day after day. You read on one occasion where he said, Satan hindered us. Paul said that. <clears throat> No doubt the devil knocked Paul down again and again, but he never knocked him out. Amen. He never quit. I believe the part of Paul was the greatest Christian ever lived. H.A. Ironside, he was the godly man. I've got most of his books in my library at home. And he said, when I read about all the Apostle Paul suffered all he went through. He said, I feel like I'm just playing at church. Well, I can say the same thing. And I see what Paul went through. Yet he never wobbled on the axle. I feel about that high. Yeah. What a Christian. What a Christian. Your thorn may not be my thorn. My thorn may not be your thorn. Your thorn could be arthritis. A lot of people have that. I have it real bad in both hands. My hands hurt me so bad, I have to put on a pair of soft gloves. And I sleep with them things on every night. I got a pair over there in the motel room right now. So much pain, arthritis. Some of you've got arthritis. That may be a thorn in the flesh. Your thorn in the flesh could be 
recurring kidney stones. I've never had one. But they tell me that's one of the most painful things you could have as a kidney stone. Yours could be a chronic sinus problem. Your thorn in the flesh could be migraine headaches. Probably some, probably there are some here that has migraine headaches. My pastor has them the worst of anybody I've ever met in my life. He doesn't even have to tell me when he's got when I look at his eyes and tell it. That's got to be very painful. Your thorn in the flesh could be heart trouble, could be cancer. <clears throat> Your thorn in the flesh could be a nervous condition. You could have had several nervous breakdowns in your lifetime. <clears throat> Your thorn in the flesh could be you've had polio. Diabetes, that's a big one. That killed my brother. Your thorn in the flesh could be depression. That's a big one. I've been there. I know what that is. I know what it is to go through that. Horrible, horrible. Go, go to bed at night, you say, with God it was day, get up in the morning, with God it was night. Can't get in really. That claim there's over 30 million people in America alone suffering from mental and emotional disorders. We consume some 24 tons of sleeping pills, tranquilizers, pills of that nature. Every day in America alone. Depression. It's a monster. Your thorn in the flesh could be a chemical imbalance in your brain or in your blood. The thorn in the flesh could be vertigo, what I've been going through. There are a number of things that could be a thorn in the flesh in your life. Then we come next of all to Paul's prayer. He prayed about it. That's what you and I need to do. Pray about it. Notice he said, in verse 8, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Three times. Look at that word besought. That means to beg. Paul begged God to take it away. So pray about it. You may not know for sure whether you have a thorn in flesh or not until you commit it to God in prayer. Paul prayed about it. And I believe if God would hear anybody's prayers, they'd hear Paul's prayers. He begged God to take it away. Read him between the lines, I could hear God saying, no, Paul, I've got something better for you. You're better off with this thorn than without it, Paul. I got too much invested in you for you to blow it. Here's a thorn in the flesh lest you get lifted up with pride and it ruin you. If a person gets lifted up with pride, especially us preachers, you got to put us on the shelf. I don't want that. <clears throat> so Paul prayed about it. Nothing so wrong with your prayer about it. After all, God's no thought. The Bible says that Jesus can be touched with the feeding of our infirmities. Yep. Yeah. 
Thank God when Jesus saved us, he didn't say, now I'll save you, goodbye, I'll see you when you get to heaven. Oh, no. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He's with us every day of our life. Thomas said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. So he never, he never leaves us. Thank God. I'm glad we don't have to bear these burdens alone. Thank you, Jesus can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Yes. Next of all, it'll be done soon. Next of all, we'll see Paul's provisions. Verse 9, and he said, that is, Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Woo, hallelujah. Yes. That's something to shout about. Now my grace is almost sufficient. My grace is sufficient. <clears throat> and not just my grace is going to be sufficient, but my grace is sufficient. That's right now. Right now. Hallelujah. Boy, you can't beat God. I'm finding God's grace is sufficient for these days. And we're living in critical times. We're living in perilous times. This Bible says this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. We're there, folks. We're there. <clears throat> Got the greatest military in the world but no backbone to use it. Oh, we got a mess in this country. Yes, we're living in perilous times and many dangerous, difficult times. I don't know what you have here at Canaan Land, but in, our, but in our church and most churches that I preach in, there'd be several men scattered out through the congregation who have a pistol on. Y'all do that here? You don't. But anyway. We have several men, designated men in our church that carries pistols. And our pastor told, told us, he said, if anyone ever comes in here and starts shooting, he said, I'm going to do like this. He said, you hit the floor so those in our church that's got guns can use them guns. Well, they won't have to worry about me hitting the floor. I'll probably run out the door. <clears throat> Paul's provisions. My grace is sufficient for thee. Mine reminds me of what I understand to be a true story. This really happened. This man, he wanted to purchase a Rolls Royce car. Now I understand them things cost a lot, a whole lot of money. Rolls Royce. I'm not looking for a Rolls Royce. I'm satisfied with my Chevrolet. If you drive a Ford, I feel sorry for you. (laughs) 
You know the difference between a Ford and a golf ball, don't you? You can drive a golf ball 300 yards. <laughs> Somebody said them Fords must have some beautiful engines because every time you see one, they got the hood up looking at it. <clears throat> I'm just a joking. You got, if you got a Ford, you may be better off than those of us that have a Chevrolet, but I doubt it. <clears throat> but this man, he went down to the Rolls Royce dealership and he looked those Rolls, Rolls Royce cars over. He had the means to buy one. He thought he'd go home and think about it before he'd commit himself to buying one. Just as he started to walk out the door, he said, by the way, how much horsepower does this thing have? <clears throat> and that dealer he got a scratch in his head. He said, sir, I'll look into that. He said, I'll wire you and let you know. So the man went on home, he wired him two words. Horsepower adequate. I like that. There was enough power on the hood of that car to cause that car to do what they designed it to do. There's enough of the grace of God in Jesus Christ to cause you and I do and be what God wants us to be. Woo! Hallelujah. My grace is sufficient for thee. Amen. Yeah, horsepower adequate. <coughs> and last of all, we see Paul's praise. Notice what his reaction was. God told him he's going to leave him with that thorn. Look what the Bible says in the middle of verse 9. Most gladly. Most what? Most gladly, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in mine infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul, you going to glory in your infirmities? That's right. Then look down here at uh, verse 10. Therefore, I take what? I take pleasure. I take pleasure in infirmities. Notice it's poor. In other words, on top of the thorn that he had in the flesh, he had a lot of infirmities. So he said, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, as needs, in persecutions. And my, how this man was persecuted constantly. In distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then am I strong. God's ways are not our ways. Darwin's theory of evolution was the survival of the fittest. This Bible teaches the survival of the weakest. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It says not many mighty, not many noble. It says God has chosen what the weak things of the world. Go, go study the book of Judges to notice all the weak people and all the weak things that God used. Why? That no flesh should glow in this presence. God said, my glory will I give unto no man. You put your hand on the glory of God, God will take his hands off of you. I don't know why in the world we have to get so lifted up with pride when this Bible says, Paul said, What hast thou that thou didst not receive? You got anything worth bragging on? The Bible says, Paul said, You received it from God. Didn't originate with you. If you and I got what we deserve, we'll be in hell right now. I 
I don't know how many times that I, I've said this in my prayers. I've said, oh God, I thank you that you don't give us what we deserve, and that's justice. Thank you give us what we don't deserve, and that's mercy. Amen. This Bible says there's mercy is a new ever morning. Woo, hallelujah. The Bible says, come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain what mercy and find grace to help in time of me. Go to God. Well, I'm through preaching. Would you stand on your feet, head bowed, eyes closed?